in the Schwitten Ham Grand, in the Ocken Hausen, In the heart of my crayon, in the top of my nose. And this is exactly how actually Jacek Kaczmarski became part of us, who is absent. And Jacek Kaczmarski actually was talking about different uh, matters concerning our topic, whereas other members of our discussions and our panel speakers include... From my left, Professor Alexander Smolar, who shall be introducing us to this uh, matter, the member of... uh, the International or European Council of International Relations, the editor of Annex, the chairman of the Batory Foundation, but also the author of the article Jews as the Polish Problem. Next to him we have Mr. Robert Kostro, the director of the Museum of Polish History, one of the three museum workers here. Uh, Well, actually, I have not introduced myself. Dariusz Stola, historian, the director of the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Robert is our second museum specialist. Next to him we have Professor Gross. <laughs> the author of books, including one by Tomasz Gross. Next to him, Professor Bakker, an anthropologist, including a book that was published two years ago, The Pogrom Yells. And Tomasz Cewiński, the third museum specialist, the director of the Auschwitz Museum. This group of people today shall be um, discussing the evolution of Polish identity and answering the question, why is it that we are discussing the uh, Polish-Jewish identity? Why is it more important than other matters? I will not be giving you any more details about our panelists. Uh, You have their details in your conference kit. Uh, We are pressed for time, and I would like to focus on the matter at hand. Also because we shall be taking a different look at matters we are all familiar with. Uh, Professor Smolar shall be speaking first. He will be giving us a brief introduction to our debate today. Ladies and gentlemen, to tell you the truth, I have uh, a couple of rather extravagant sentences to start with. I was offered the topic Jews as a Polish problem. It contains an allusion to the annex periodical mentioned by the professor uh, before and the block that we published as uh, a set of topics, Jews as a Polish problem, that was 1986. That included an article which marked the beginning of uh, a theme that was then later commented on by Antomas Gross. Truthfully, given the illusion, I accepted the topic, but I had a problem right from the beginning with it, also because I do not believe that Jews are a specific Polish problem. They were then, they are not now. What does that mean? That means that today, Jews are not a Polish problem in terms of their uniqueness. The other thesis of mine might be even more shocking. We have come to the end of a period which we might refer to as the Polish Holocaust. The Holocaust as a phenomenon impacting our identity following World War II, but not only that, it had impacted integration, European integration, as well as a number of other topics and a number of taboos uh, which had actually made their way into European and non-European policies. And thirdly, not no less shocking, that we have uh, come to an end of European Jewishness. In order to lay grounds for future discussions concerning Polish identity, we decided, or I decided, to offer a more broad perspective. Let me start with my first thesis, Jews as the Polish problem. 
When picking the topic itself, when writing an article entitled Taboo and Innocent, I was deeply convinced that these five words would actually span whatever is most important in terms of Polish-Jewish relations. We were people who left after 1968. We all left Poland, whereas what was left in our memories, both in terms of emotions and intellect, was specifically the year 1968. We were deeply convinced and we were very much aware that it was not only the problem of authorities. We were obviously battling anti-Semitism. Secondly, silence. Jews were eliminated from uh, history books. Even Janek Gross, who became famous thanks to his uh, Polish-Jewish book. I remember that when he wrote his first book in the United States about Poland and occupation, he did not mention Jews at all. In a certain sense, he actually conformed to the arch archetype of exteriorizing anything and everything that was not ethnically Polish. He actually did offer a certain look about Poland of the past and terms of ethnicity, culture, politics, and so on and so forth. In other words, silence, a very high level of aggression against Jews, even in 1968. I must say that the attitude towards Jews leaving were, was quite ambivalent or ambiguous. I had actually, um, when I left Poland, I was driven by a sense of coldness, not necessarily by the fact that I was thrown out of university, but I encountered coldness. People said, what do you want from communists? Uh, Kulaks were oppressed and the intelligentsia were oppressed, so why not Jews? So I do believe that people did, fail, did not understand, failed to understand Jews and their emotional problems. It was not entirely understood that the Holocaust was a very specific problem which cannot be comprehended in more general categories. There were certain elements there, I must say, which had impacted myself when I wrote the book, and my reaction, or our reactions then proved that we were right. Let me recall another memory. When we were working on the first issue of Annex, Janek and I offered a thesis that Poland actually is split down into the democratic in, and the totalitarian. Obviously, we attempted a legitimization of emigration. And I must say that quite a few distinguished people from Warsaw told me to throw that out. And my wife and I had actually worked on getting rid of this forward from 1,500 copies. It was uh, believed that we were denouncing the Polish elite as Jewish. And on the 10th anniversary of March, we, I do believe, published one of the best issues of a Polish underground periodicals, the Krytyka. And I must say that uh, the Jewish matter was absent on the 10th anniversary of March when things were discussed, things of different importance, of varying importance, Jews were miss missing. Today, our world is totally different. The Polish problem, or the Polish issue, which definitely exists, it is there, that goes without saying. Indeed, the title, Jews is a Polish problem, is an exaggeration, unless we conclude that Jews are an issue in other countries as well. Obviously, in Poland, we do have the specificity, the level of anti-Semitism is an issue, albeit it has most recently been concluded that Greece is the most anti-Semitic country in Europe. It turns out that uh, Greece does not really vary from a Muslim or Islamic country. 60% of anti-Semitic people actually live there, or 60% of Greeks are anti-Semitic. Whereas in Poland, 
93% of Poles believe that Jews murdered Jesus, not to mention the blood crime described by Professor Tokarska Bakker. She wrote about it much earlier, describing those beliefs which definitely prove the specificity of the problem, and it is obviously a Polish problem, a major issue. It is definitely also an issue for the Church. The Polish specificity is also about the sequence of anti-Semitism. Usually when we describe it, going back to ancient times, we begin with the classic religious anti-Semitism I mentioned before followed by the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. We have racism, followed by political anti-Semitism, the myths of uh, the domination of Jews in politics and economy, all of which followed by what I refer to as the post-modern. Poland does not have that sequence. Poland is all about coexistence, but it also did, did recognize all these forms, the um, economic, classic and political anti-Semitism plus racism. Poles do not wish to admit that. But let me recall, but let me recall a priest from Gdańsk, a hero of uh, solidarity, who declared that the Jewish origins ought to be analyzed five generations back, which smacks of racism. One could be silent about it, nevertheless, that dimension is present. Karol Modzelewski wrote that uh, you can be a Pole, whether you are of German or other origin, but you cannot claim to be a Pole if your name is Blumstein. And I must say that there were other authors who were much more strict in their claims that it is not a matter of religion. Let me, however, come back to the postmodern shortly. Let me move very briefly to the shock of freedom. The shock of freedom began with what? One of the organizers of the um, crosses of gravel, on gravel referred to as the Polish Jewish War. You probably do remember the Carmel issue. The Auschwitz battle had actually laid certain ground in the um, Third Polish Republic. Primate Glemp declared, dear Jews, respect the rule and the law of the hosts. Pro the primate decided that Poles were the hosts, although the Polish name of Oświęcim was then turned to Auschwitz in order to exteriorate the matter altogether. What does that prove? That definitely proves the lack of Polish awareness. Until then, it, then it was deeply believed that Oświęcim, to use the Polish term was part of a Polish martyrdom and the martyrdom of a number of nations. In other words, Poles did not really know that uh, Auschwitz was about Jews in 95% of its existence and operations. Poles do, did not know that. Even until today, research proves that the level of awareness has increased. We do have a museum specialist here who can confirm that. Nevertheless, we should definitely also ask a more general question. Who suffered more? Results have become better. Jews did pay a huge price and the awareness of that is growing. Nevertheless, in the 1990s, everybody believed that Poles were the main victims of Auschwitz, which definitely stemmed from the lack of awareness, but also from the repression of knowledge and deep pangs of the conscience. Nevertheless, Polish citizens had a form of local knowledge. Generalizing it was a difficult matter. Without communication or democratic discussions, things were very, very difficult. All that was quite important. Important, nevertheless, once the Holocaust 
made it to the Polish awareness. Jan Tomasz Gross wrote the most important, I believe, book about the matter. And then it shocked our neighbors as well. The shock was there. It was great. And I must say, in the wake of many decades of my life in France, I was in awe of the openness of the debate. I must declare that when um, the famous French film was made in 1969, the French government banned it from the TV and the cinema. It was only shown in one small movie theater in the Latin Quarter, which definitely proves how difficult it is for us to battle the past. In Poland, there, are, there were certain claims which were absolutely unacceptable that we disagreed with. Nevertheless, the fundamental thing that they proved was a battle for historical truth and for actual Polish identity, something that we shall be discussing shortly. Indeed, we did have the very high level of anti-Semitism in Poland. I must say that it was hugely important to me what happened when the exhibition was opened. I am not going to be discussing all comments concerning the museum, but it was hugely significant that Gazeta Wyborcza, that is a daily, and the Polityka Weekly, the two leading political periodicals uh, wrote about the return of the Jews and actually the Politica Weekly published the return of the Jews on their cover. There is no such thing. There is the return of the dead Jews. The museums discuss the dead. That is their function. What we are facing here is the return of the dead Jews. Moreover, Maria Janion did write a book about our deceased in the context of Europe. Uh, this museum shows a certain process of reintegrating with the past of Jews as components of the society. And let me emphasize that we are definitely walking towards Europe with the Jewish deceased. Some people believe that Europe are a European nation or that there is a Jewish nation in Europe. The um, head of Pagwash, um, the late head of Pagwash, he was referred to as um, the eternal Pole, albeit Poles perceive him as Jewish. You do have to realize that there were a number of Nobel Prize winners who believe themselves to be Polish, but were never listed as Polish by the Poles, which ultimately proves the exclusive definition of Polishness, albeit we are discussing when discussing citizenship, that would indeed be true. This is wherein the problem lies. Now let us move to the end of the Holocaust era. That end began very long ago. That end began when the Holocaust began uh, returning to the public speech, i.e. in the 1960s with Eichmann's trial. Then we had the um, rebellion of the German young people against the generation, the entire red generation. Then we had the Holocaust. It was a poor movie. Nevertheless, we did have the reaction, it became an unblocking factor and it became one of the fundamental topics or subjects. And I must say that history was rethought. The history of post-war Europe was rethought. Uh, Milou, a uh, distinguished English historian wrote a book about Europe as a process of reconstructing national states.
He declared that the European Union served the purpose of recreating national states, which might also explain, explain today's crisis. But we are also talking about moral reconstruction, not only Germany, but of all our countries. That Time is coming to a close. It began in 1967, the Six-Day War, when David all of a sudden became Goliath. That was a shock to the world that Jews are beginning to win against armies after armies. It turned out that Jews are also a military power. That was a multidimensional shock. De Gaulle, who was already their great politician, said a sentence which was a, sh which was a shock to many. He declared that Jews were an elite and arrogant and self-confident nation. In France, the um, country of Pétain could actually declare something like that in the wake of 1967. In such context, our march looks totally different. Once we take a look at iconography, many left-wing periodicals follow the uh, 1968 March propaganda or post-March propaganda. A certain change occurred, fundamental change included 9-11, that is the terrorist attack against New York and Washington on September 11th, and that created fear and obsession and obsessive fear of um, the Islamic world. This is exactly when the French ambassador in England declared the um, small shitty nation being the source of global problems. All of a sudden it turns out that Israel may actually be a threat to global peace. Last but not least, uh, we should mention what was going on this summer, the Gaza Strip and the measures used. I do believe that this was the Israeli strategy. Israel was losing the uh, war referred to as asymmetrical. The very weak David can actually battle the powerful Goliath and win. Given the terrorist attacks and other measures. Nevertheless, there are a number of other matters that we ought to mention the context of the end of the times of the Holocaust. Zbigniew Brzeziński declared a thesis according to which nations make it to the public forum and begin acting a very important role, which is hugely important to the majority of the world, albeit seven-tenths of the world believe that the Holocaust is an irritating matter. This is something that Professor, Professor Vrubel told me yesterday. We are facing a certain um, imperial narration here. A white man uh, caused a boo-boo to another white man. Why should others take care of that or care about it at all? This is when uh, the item or the notion of revolt comes in or rebellion. This is specifically what we see in Western Union, but the West in Western Europe, generation after generation, is trying to rebel against the status quo. They do not feel British, they do not feel German or French, they do not really have any identity or language indeed. What they are trying to do is to focus their identity around radical Islam and identifying themselves with the Palestinians. In other words, the Middle Eastern war does have a long arm reaching Western Europe. France and other countries have already seen attacks against Jews. Today, from the Jewish viewpoint, the uh, Jewish matter is more important to other parts of Europe, Poland included. Not to mention the fact that Poland is indeed a silent and strategic partner of Israel. And last but not least, we should mention left-wing anti-Semitism. 
Jews were very important to all left-wing movements, so, which was natural given their fragility, their natural cosmopolitanism or internationalism. Human rights and ideology, ideology were based on the Jewish nation. They were build, building their position with force, soft power, but hard power. Israel is definite proof of that. And that such alienation has been proven by the fact that elites walked away. Israel, together with the United States, have begun continuing colonial tradition. And I must say that Israeli policies do support the matter, including the fact that negotiations were abandoned in a crucial situation. Two countries walked away from the negotiations table. What does that mean? Well, in, this would mean that apartheid without apartheid would become the truth and the reality. Today, Arabs are there in the state of Israel, even if the formal status is different. And that is something that is going to involve Israeli democracy. It shall be a Jewish state based on a case system on apartheid and... Uh, should we have a democratic state, it will cease being a Jewish state. If we do not follow a division, and whatever we have been doing for the past 20 years proves that division shall be impossible, well, that ultimately will lead to civil war in Israel. All this means that the Reality is changing and language is changing, also vis-à-vis -vis Israel, but also vis-à-vis -vis Jews. Jews do identify themselves with Israel, even if they do not want to travel there. Israel, after the Holocaust and in the wake of humiliation, is today a symbol of dignity, of pride, and of a place of uh, refuge. Israel is actually now becoming a threat to the diasporas. Um, fights in the German and French uh, streets are actually a protest against Jewishness. We, it has been proven to us that whatever is going on in Europe, the anti-Semitic movement is uh, minimal, is kept to a bare minimum. Actually, I have just been told that I should be closing my speech. The chairman is being more than gracious to me. Let me thus move to the fundamental and last part, the probable end of Jewishness in Europe. Well, nothing dramatic there. This year in France, uh, 5,000 French Jews are meant to be moving to Israel, and that is quite dramatic. The reasons are obvious, fear and a sense of insecurity. That same phenomenon is being repeated elsewhere, but that is not only about uh, emigration, it is also about uh, assimilation and... Uh, mass emigration or mass travel. The um, representative of the great Jewish organization um, was talking to me about a meeting in the 1970s with Giscard d'Estaing, who was then discussing the um, Jewish um, diaspora or community who had been present in France and in that part of Europe for 1,000 years, whereas today Jews do feel alienated in different European countries. We also have the matter of external perception. We have the influx of uh, new Jewish emigration to Warsaw and to Berlin. This is what the press tells us. We shall be experiencing a transformation of that part of the Jewish community into uh, purely Israeli emigration. Mówiąc prawdę, 
Truthfully, I have a lot to say, but I will stop here because I have been going on and on. Thank you very much for your attention. I was uh, telling you that even if uh, you have a lot of knowledge or extensive knowledge, you will definitely learn something new. And I do believe that Professor Smolar has exceeded our expectations here. Now over to other panelists. Uh, there. Time is limited, 10 minutes each. Now we'll hand over to our audience. Ms. Joanna Tokarska-Bakir will be speaking first. I do not know whether I am heard. Well, I have actually written down, written down what I have to say. I'm going to read it out to you. Twelve minutes. Why do we think, asks Dariusz Stola, that for the Polish identity, the Jewish cause is particularly important? There are two reasons. There are obviously many reasons, many books could be written, let us focus on these two. In Christian Europe, Jews introduced the archetype of the other. All other differences, sexual, traditional, religious, are modeled on this archetype. The place of the dead Jews in Poland remains active and produces new subalterns. With regard to what Professor Smolar said about the Greeks, we could also take a look at the Greek anti-Semitism with regard to European financial institutions actually uses this archetype of the other. Each identity is formed in opposition to what is regarded as being different from itself, what it demonizes and closes in a symbolic image. In that sense, Jewish otherness, religious, traditional, axiological, supersedes and even creates historic Polishness as an identity marker once we agree to that term and terminology, the Jewish question will never disappear because it has been inscribed into Polish counter-effect. The other matter is even more impo important. The Polish um, citizens and Polish authorities had been abandoned during the Holocaust. Igor Stachowicz's undead Jews are still haunting us. Evidence of this abandonment can be found in the report which made Jan Karski the man about whom we are discussing, about whom we are talking today. In the text of the introduction to our conference, we read, on quote, a memory is sometimes used instrumentally abused, treated as a weapon against the other, unquote. Indeed, each and every person can be used instrumentally, including Jan Karski. A great man always casts a shadow, a refuge for many. We either have politics or history, a contradiction. Let us consider to what end can Polish historical policy now use Jan Karski. In reply, we'll quote an excerpt from the report by Jan Karski, removed from the version passed on to the Allies, recorded by Gross in his ghastly decade. The full text of the report was published in 1983 by David Engel. Let me quote the missing part of the report. Their attitude, i.e. the Polish societies, to Jews was mostly ruthless, often merciless. They benefit in large measure from the powers that the new situation has given them. They often even abuse them. I must state, taking complete responsibility for what I am saying, that resolving the Jewish matter by the Germans is a serious and dangerous tool for the moral pacification of many Polish citizens. The nation hates their mortal enemy. But this issue creates a sort of na narrow ledge or bridge where Germans and a large mass of Polish society meet. Some despise and discard and are outraged by the barbaric German methods. Others take a look at the Germans with an interest and an often as not delighted eye, being annoyed at the differences of the former group. The creation of a broader common front would encounter great difficulties on behalf of broad parts of the Polish society whose anti-Semitism 
had not decreased, unquote. We could ask how the removal of this particular paragraph influenced the wording and the invitation to this conference. How did it actually influence the fact that complaints were received with disbelief? Reverend Professor Chrostowski ironically defines them today as the Hagada, in other words, unbelievable and mythical, and set in the lacrimonial Jewish discourse of history. How did the removal of this particular paragraph influence the wording in the invitation to this conference, where we read about Poles as powerless witnesses of the Holocaust? The definition powerless witnesses of the Holocaust introduced in the book Perpetrators, victim, Victims and Bystanders in the strict sense was the removal of the differences between two types of Hilberg's categories, witnesses and bystanders. Jan Karski was neither a powerless witness nor a bystander. He was a witness. The category of witness comes from the Christian term martyrs, witnessing to Christ being a martyr, which was an indication of the price paid for witnessing, for testimony. Karski fulfills both meanings of the term, but it is not fulfilled by that large part of Polish society, which, as Karski wrote, met Germans on this narrow ledge. A witness to the Holocaust must not be confused by a bystander who, according to etymology, refrains from acting. Polish onlookers of the Holocaust acted as they did because they themselves and their authorities, as well as the most important spiritual authorities in the country, did not consider that anything could be done when the Germans took those undead Jews. Not a single section of the railway leading to Auschwitz was blown up. Tom, Thomas Merton, in his book Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, pointed to the moral aspect of bystanding. Now, for the Polish debate about whether the bystander who is watching the Holocaust can be saved, key texts were ones such as the Turned Off Economy by Kazimierz Wicka, the unjustly forgotten text by Arthur Sandauer, the situation of the Polish writer of Jewish extraction in the 20th century, which preceded by four years the text by Boyski, Poor Poor Poles Look at the Ghetto, and by three years, a small arts taboo and innocence, and three successful books published by Gross in the early years of the 21st century. Each of these works resulted in in-depth discussions in Polish society, debates that make the society proud, definitely singling it out against societies of Central and Eastern Europe. Nevertheless, we should also mention the critics of these debates. Arthur Sandauer, reconstructed their mental situation as follows, although his words, written two decades earlier, did not re refer to Jedwabne, quote, a young Pole who was taught in Poland that the society behaved in an exemplary way during the occupation and who, when abroad, reads about the slaughter of camp escapees by Polish peasants, has the choice to either accept that forces are at work abroad nobody knows why, but you have obstinately picked on his nation, or that he had been taught lies in school. We should add that it is impossible to initiate a discussion due to the communication and censorship barriers between Poland and the West. Unquote. And further, quote, let young Pole not reject with force, throwing the blame upon the nation that was partly a victim, instead of on the perpetrators of the mas massacre. Why attribute the wrong address to these claims? Is it not true that Germany made an act of contrition, but in Poland such an act was lacking? Unquote. In the wake of 1989, strictly speaking in 2004, uh, when uh, Memory and Responsibility, edited by Robert Kostra and Tomasz Merta, was published, a generational change appeared in the Polish discourse on memory. An important ally came to the annoyed Pole, as mentioned by Sandauer, resisting the possible need for an act of repentance. This ally has become the 
post memory, in other words, organized state historical policy. In studies of post memory trauma, this is memory not based on empirical evidence but on family transmission. Its appearance is associated with the deaths of direct witnesses and the augmentation of ignorance of second and third generations, which in the final demise of communism was protected against a more difficult version of history. Until 2000, with the appearance of uh, Gross's neighbors, Yedwabne meant nothing to anyone, similarly to a dozen other names of places of 1941 pogroms. Anti-Jewish pogroms after the First World War also seem to be improbable, may I remind you, that several took place several times over and over at the same localities, which obviously was also classified as a Soviet provocation which exempted people from the need to analyze the attitude of the crowd. The slogan such as the wartime abandonment of Polish Jews during the Holocaust was inc incomprehensible and the education of successive generations of young people had been based on such edited memory. The eruption of this policy was a backlash to Gross's book, although it could not silence anybody, but since it was legitimized and financed by the state, while combating anti-Semitism is not, its impact on consecutive young minds is invaluable. Research concerning the Holocaust and anti-Semitism is increasing. Nevertheless, it does not permeate school programs or curricula. They are blocked by an overview, overview of the past, with which young people identify the successes of those from Sandawa's era. Simplifying hegemony is a vision within which it is not the facts that count, only they, their ideological importance. Should the facts contradict, so much the worse for the facts. Hegemony is the principle organizing public memory, requiring the remembering of a special filter allowing one to sift elements too difficult. That what is too difficult is determined by politicians. This hegemonic overview of the past, which does not care about facts, is pleased with inversions. I shall conclude with three examples. The first is associated with the concept of the Paradisus Judeorum, which has already been assigned to part of the main exhibition in the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Stanisław Kotz's study in 1937 shows that the text is the anonymous part of the Latin lampoons planted at the king's wedding reception of 1606. Paradisus Judeorum was a polemizing concept, whereas today we have been neutralizing it as an old Polish paradise for Jews. The other inversion concerns the just. Obviously, the question itself is rather rhetoric because every and each and every participant of the discussion knew that uh, they were not heroes, they were renegades. As mentioned by Baruch Bergman, the uh, SKP from the Polish. Uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto, quote, I decided to go to church on the church of St. Anna. And well, I will never forget that the priest from the pulpit said that there are those among you who help Jews, that there are those of you who are hiding Jews, but I forbid you, never. They crucify the Lord Jesus. If God wanted, he would know better how to help. The just or righteous became heroes. As of when, this is going to sound harsh, but it has to be said, uh, as of the moment when the Polish society could draw some benefit from them, the problem is that Jews who were saved during the war were rescued by individuals, contrary to the society, which today is proud of such individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the intellectual and time discipline, and now han I hand over to Robert Kostro. Well, actually, my situation is triply difficult. Well, I am standing in for Darek Gavin, who was meant to uh, be speaking here today, hence I was not actually prepared. 
to um, a more serious intervention. But also I am not really focusing on Jewish questions in my professional life. And thirdly, also because I should refer to what Professor Tokarska Bakir said. That is not the time or place for it. I will do it later. Nevertheless, so why did I decide to stand in for Darius Gavin? Even if not dealing with the Jewish question um, and not really being prepared for it. Well, as the uh, director of the Museum of Polish History, I have to focus on Poles and Jews and the relation between the two nations, not to mention the fact that uh, I am also simply a person who comments on Polish history and important matters therein. Professionally, speaking of all, all these issues, I do have my own beliefs, my own opinions, and uh, my own convictions, uh, albeit uh, they are not based on such deep academic knowledge as that represented by my predecessor. Let me start with something different than I had planned. Let me start with Polish history, with the Museum of Polish History, and let us start with why Jews are actually important to our history, also from the viewpoint of this museum and my own. Why did we actually decide to organize the Museum of Polish History? It is a response to a conviction that after 1989 we approached a new era and that we should be rethinking many important matters concerning our history. That era relates to at least two phenomena. The first is obvious. We have a democratic sovereign state, which we did not really have under communism, not to mention the fact that uh, um, the Second Polish Republic was not a model democracy specifically after 1926. Another very important reason is that Poland, in today's form and shape, has been in existence since 1945. That is obvious to anybody who is enlightened and or educated. Nevertheless, it becomes less, less obvious when we talk to young people or when we talk to, uh, to someone who doesn't, is not necessarily young, but despite having lived in Poland since 1945, is not aware of her history. It has to be said that in order to explain um, to a young person or to a foreigner or to someone brought up in communism, that in order to discuss Poland, we should discuss Poland um, of the pre-1939 times, and we should also discuss Poland um, in the context of the times of partition. Otherwise, we are not going to understand anything. Because if a Polish child is taught Lithuania, you motherland of mine, which opens Adam Mickiewicz's Epic poem is not taught what it actually means. That child would understand nothing. Well, we do have to refer to Tomasz Merta, aforementioned Tomasz Mer Merta. We have to understand that the Polish, that the first Polish Republic was an intellectual and idealistic and historical creation. Now, were we to go back to our cultural foundations, we have to mention the Republican tradition on the one hand and the multinationality of our state on the other. Without these two concepts, it is absolutely impossible to understand Polish history or Polish culture, if we understand that Polish young people are being brought up without any knowledge of the relations of the Polish history with Jewish history, Belarusian history, Lithuanian history or German history indeed. Być może wielu z Państwa 
Possibly many of you have already noticed or have already seen the 2012 exhibition Under a Common Sky. That was our first attempt to describe the uh, mosaic of history and of religions of the First Polish Republic. Jews, obviously, constitute a very important element of that mosaic, of that puzzle, if you will. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the first location or the first venue where Jews have to make an appearance. I'm not going to be speaking chronologically. You do understand that I'm not going to discuss the full script of who appeared where. Nevertheless, let me emphasize the highlights which are well worth our attention. Jews were definitely a group, uh, hugely important in terms of Polish economy, but they were also a group uh, which uh, definitely had uh, specific rights, uh, very important rights. Today's exhibition, similarly to our own exhibition, had emphasized the uh, deficit of tolerance. We're not going to be creating a mythical utopia. Nevertheless, uh, in comparison with other nations of the time, Poland did seem a country hugely tolerant, tolerant to the other, Jews included. You have to understand that Poland for many generations had been a country of immigrants, which ultimately meant that uh, the many arriving to Poland had to actually enjoy conditions conducive to the uh, country of immigration until mid-17th century. We were another America, so to speak. Another element that I wanted to draw your attention to is the process of how Polish identity evolved. What I have in mind here is the period between the January uprising and the early 20th century. The January uprising is a hugely important time. That was when we were still facing a moment of some hope that Jews would become part of Polish history. Jews, i.e. Poles of uh, the Moses belief. We did have many Polish uh, Jewish leaders. We did have uh, when Rabbi um, Abermais was being buried. That was a huge, hugely important moment. So the division was not yet there. That division, that gash, appeared uh, somewhere around the late 19th and early 20th century. Obviously, we do still have many people of double identity. Nevertheless, this was uh, when Jews began creating a separate nation on Polish territory. Let me not go into detail here. I am not a historical expert on that time. Nevertheless, we do have that second moment when the theme will have to be highlighted also in the context of other nations making their way here, Lithuanians, Ukrainians and Belarusians, although the latter uh, had a much weaker identity than the previous two nations. The Second Polish Republic is another very important time, specifically in uh, terms of the fact that the Second Polish Republic did not manage to resolve the issue of her minorities. Please do not get me wrong, I do believe that the Second Polish Republic was a hugely positive time in our history. Nevertheless, that does not mean uh, that we did not have our deep shadows lurking therein. Another very important matter, let me now move to the um, discourse or debate with Madame Professor Tokarska Bakir. Um, well, World War II, not because it is uncomfortable from the political vantage point, but because there is a deep conviction shared 
by uh, the great mass of Polish historians. Uh, well, I disagree with the perspective you offered. That is not to say that I am questioning what Karski said. I am not questioning that there was a huge mass of Polish society, of Polish citizens, uh, who, were, who were indeed bystanders or who were actually participating in the Holocaust. Nevertheless, given the fact that the excerpt of Karski's report was removed and uh, anybody who works in the civil administration knows that each and every report is adjusted to match reality for a variety of reasons which I shall not mention here in detail. Well, anyway, any report is adjusted to its current reality. Just because that fragment was removed, we should not conclude that the Polish underground state was only passive. Yes, indeed. We may have deep reservations with regard to the reality, one might well wonder what else could be done. Nevertheless, all official documents of the Polish government in exile, but also the information bulletin which was published, in other words, all official documents seem to prove something different. They define the issue in a somewhat different manner. I have to close. Okay, let me draw to a close then. In other words, what is hugely important and what is uh, definitely a topic for discussion is that we ought to be emphasizing different attitudes or different approaches. Nevertheless, I do not believe that in this discussion concerning Polish-Jewish relations, we can or could actually reach a, an unambiguous conclusion, not in terms of politics, but in terms of science. We, I believe, cannot reach a stage where we could actually declare that the Home Army or that the Polish underground did nothing. Jan Karski was not a lone wolf acting against or in contradiction to all others. He was a representative of the Polish state. We do have the shameful episode of Kielce or of 1968. These episodes have to be made part of the discourse and the museum. Without further ado, let me mention two other things or a couple of other things, just a couple of words about something I consider important. This is something that uh, Professor Smolar also mentioned. I personally am part of a generation which was brought up in the sense of a lack of knowledge about who Jews were. In that sense, I'm also an artifact of the entire educational process uh, whereby I had only learned in 19 80s when I was in high school that I was, um, that Jews were there. Annex was part of my education as well, that goes without saying. And I do believe that this museum is by no means an attempt to stop the debate. It is definitely an attempt to summarize the debate and the experience itself. It is also an attempt to discover and rediscover Jews and their history, but also of um, the many difficult matters described by Professor Gross and matters we are discussing today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now hand over to Professor Gross. Thank you very much. In uh, a simile to Professor Tokarska Bakir, I prepared something in writing. I declared to be delivering it over the next 12 minutes. We have no, had no Jews in Poland for the past several decades, although their physical absence determines the topic that we are going to discuss today. Since the end of World War II, and def definitely as of the late 40s of the 20th century, when the great wave of migration of the remnant of the Holocaust left Poland, Jews have not been a problem for Poles in an economic, demographic, or occupational sense, or in any other material dimension of social life. Jews as a Polish problem, as a spiritual Polish problem, 
It is the question of Polish anti-Semitism, as discussed by Professor Smolar, because in the broad sense of Polish spirituality, the Jew does not operate as anything other than personification of evil. Thus, there is nothing particularly original in this um, issue. Until European Jews were murdered, everywhere in the Christian tradition in all of Europe, anti-Semitism was a norm, a, a universal phenomenon expressed in many ways in the programs of political parties and social movements, in the teachings of churches, in practice in a variety of institutions, not excluding states, which, however, was already an important departure from the root of European identity the Enlightenment's ideal of equality of citizenship. Anti-Semitism in Poland has its specificity, as any other general phenomenon, but it is not purely Polish. However, when discussing mutual relations between Poles and Jews, we use the language of the lexicon of anti-Semites with the common use of the Jewish issue or question. The transformation from what we refer to as a Jewish question to the Polish question is an attempt to understand how a Polish norm became a Polish question. World War II was a turning po point in the social history of anti-Semitism, when, to no one's surprise, we were witness to a civil civilizational catastrophe. It turned out that the Nazi policy of Jewish extermination could not be resisted by populations of occupied Europe, and apart from Danes and Bulgarians, all participated in the crime, each, obviously, in its own way. What should we keep in mind in order to understand the experience of war, which stemmed out of Polish anti-Semitism? We have to remember uh, that there were more Jews in Poland than anywhere else in Europe before the war, nearly three and a half million. They were scattered around the country, mostly living hand to mouth on the lowest level of the social ladder, assimilated Jews wealthy or with a profession, were a very small handful of Polish Jewry, in contrast to Western Europe, where Jews were usually part of baptized bourgeoisie. Despite the fact that ethnic groups were reluctant to, to mix with one another, mixed marriages were very rare, the point of contact between Poles and Jews were numerous and involved millions. Daily contact with Jews were primarily the lower layers of Polish society. Right-wing and peasant political parties, university students and aggressive the anti-Semitic clergy were the main exploiters. When living in Poland, one could not avoid contact with anti-Semitism, which emanated from many sources endowed with social authority. Over time, German occupational policy put a dramatic question before Poles, how to behave in the face of increasingly cruel repressions that Jews were subject to. Two most important Polish institutions upon which society was based during the war did not help in our search for the answer. Even disregarding the silence of Pope Pius XII concerning Jewish tragedy, one has to say of the Polish Roman Catholic Church that they left their flock to their own devices when it came to the matter. In their messages about the attitude and statement, the Archbishop of Krakow, Adam Sapiecha, as well as other members of the Polish Church hierarchy, I now quote Father Stanisław Musiał, quote, nothing, there are no traces of compassion or concern, this is frightening, unquote. Concerning the behavior of ordinary clergy, well, nothing else can be said, which is quite unfortunate. There were exceptions to the, work, to the rule, specifically convents run by nuns who had harbored hundreds or even thousands Jewish children throughout occupied Poland. Another standard-setting institution for Poles who had washed its hand and was not interested in the fate of the Jews was the underground state. By addressing its actions almost exclusively to ethnically Polish population, the underground repudiated the civil ethos, accepting the racial division of Polish society as imposed by the occupant. The creation of the Zegota late in the day, a drop in the ocean 
question of the needs of the Jewish population does not change the overall p picture. If we were to critically organize the lexicon of the history of the occupation, one would actually use the term the Poles underground state rather than the term Polish underground state. Consequences have been recorded from the first day of the occupation, quote, it hurts, it terribly hurts, when it is not any foreign enemy, but them, sons and daughters of Poland, which will again be ashamed for them, then laugh, choking with laughter, seeing how on the street our common, common enemy plays with Jews, beats and torments the elderly, steals with abandon, cuts off the beards of old Jews as bread is cut, and they, today like us, deprived of their homeland, who like us at first hand feel the cruel hand of the enemy at such time, they laugh and rejoice when the pride and honor of Poland suffers such humiliation, when the white Polish eagle wallows on the ground among clipped beards, the black and grey hair from Jewish beards. Is this not a disgrace for all eternity? It hurts, it terribly hurts." Unquote. Mordechai Gabirtik, a Krakow folk poet, bard of the Jewish street, wrote this song. Around the time when Jan Karski was presenting a report on the attitudes of Poles towards Jews under occupation in Angers. He was told not to falsify the report in order not to compromise Poland in the eyes of the Allies. He described the behavior of the broader, broader masses of Polish society and their attitude to the Jews, quote, mostly ruthless, often merciless. They benefit in large measure from the powers and they often abuse them even. Taking on a passive attitude towards the status quo threatens to result in the demoralization of Polish society and all the dangers arising therefrom even if impartial, but in many cases, sincere compliance by the significant number of Poles with the enemy." Unquote. Karski did not know how deeply true was his intuition. The imagination of someone who grew up in Europe could not take in all the dangers resulting from the sincere compliance by a significant number of Poles with the enemy. He was writing at the beginning of the war when relatively little had happened. He was a man of great sensitivity, however, and the sense that the crowd jeering at the Jew placed on the battle, I quote from the reminiscence of Marek Edelman, written down by Hannah Kral in an interview in Out With God, was a step into the abyss of demoralizing, which, among other things, resulted in the bomb war repeated along the length, breadth, and upwards of Polish society that, quote, you will need to build Hitler a monument after the war because he freed Poland from Jews. Unquote. During the war, anti-Semitism among Poles was a soil which grafted behavior completely at odds with the image of the national ethos according to the principle for our freedom and yours. The lack of compassion for persecuted Jews, mass participation in the looting carried out by the German of Jewish property, and hunting down and murdering Jews who tried to save their lives by hiding on the Aryan side, I mention phenomena spread throughout the country. All of these behaviors occurred in the context of the total courage and dedication of resistance against Germans. As a result, the behavior of Poles towards Jews during the Nazi occupation not only undermines the spiritual identity of constitutive elements of the community, but also undermines the significance of a very important chapter of national history as formulated by the German historia, historian Goloman, who wrote about the Second World War, quote, in this case, what is lower than the bottom, the basis determines the nature of the whole, unquote. As Karski predicted, widespread anti-Semitism among Poles, in conjunction with the madness of the Nazi, led to a demoralization of Polish society. To make matters worse, crimes committed against Jews remained unpunished. Even the greatest villains who murdered Jews and sentenced them to death were not really persecuted after the war. How is it? A huge part of the population, mainly inhabitants of small towns and villages where everybody knows each other well, live day by day and grow up among murderers. What is done is done. Generations born up after the war must now answer the question of how to shake off the nightmare of an anti-Semitic legacy.
We all know that you cannot cope with the individual or collective trauma without revealing the background circumstances. Therefore, the only way to work through the tragic disgrace of our parents' and grandparents' generation is to talk about the past with a full voice. A defensive posture, whether in the spirit of showing the so-called full historical context that only in Poland there were no collaborators and that only in Poland was the death penalty and collective, collective responsibility meted out for helping Jews, both arguments irre irrelevant, or that Jews collaborated with the Soviets and sent Poles to Siberia, not true either, or the disposition in the name of the Polish raison d'etat, to say the least about the entire phenomenon, Highlighting the role of Zagota and the righteous is a defensive attitude. Ultimately, the only defense of relativism or attempt to avoid a topic is a, a crime. The baby has been um, poured out with the bathwater. All euphemisms only perpetuate a sense of collective guilt. They are in conflict with the national in interest. Should one understand the term as um, developing a strong collective identity and taking place surrounded with due respect in the community of nations. What we need is a full disclosure about Polish-Jewish relations. We will never free ourselves from the ghost of the past, of the Jewish question already morphed into the Polish question. At best, as a community, we are going to be living in constant fear because uh, Somewhere in the world, people do, by mistake, ignorance or malice, all three at the same time, again, will write about Polish camps, which was a misdemeanor by Polish diplomacy in the United States. With regard to the current situation, one should, above all, emphasize that uh, the non-counterfeit history of the Holocaust in Poland is now being written by Polish historians. Sin this is why the Holocaust Research Center was set up at the Polish Academy of Sciences. This is why the Holocaust as an annual publication started appearing. In other areas, apart from the sciences, the situation is worse. In concluding, I would like to add a few words to the recent discussion on the construction of the Monument to the Righteous right next to the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. The dispute concerns the question of the location of the monument only. Although, as mentioned by the professor, there is no consensus in the Polish society as the role played by the righteous in the war. Without thinking about the inscription on the monument, we should conclude that the initiative will be seen as setting a race by, with hurdles by Karski's bench, Sendler's path, the monument to the righteous, and a yet another monument to the righteous um, designed by the National Democrats, uh, by the church or next to the church of the All Saints on the Grzybowski Square. Without an appropriate inscription, one can create the impression that um, the purpose to erect a monument was to knock the, into the heads of the visitors of the Museum of the History of Polish Jews that we were what we were. It seems that the answer to the question of what the monument is intended to achieve has not been thought through. I realize this when I, I heard as an important argument in favor from a person supporting the initiative that Poland will not spend a single red cent on the monument. Such an otherwise admirable concern for the public budget displays a mistaken reasoning about what is really at stake. Ever since 1953, when they created the Yad Vashem in uh, Jerusalem since 1953 have been thanking Poles who saved Jews during the Nazi occupation and honor their memory, planting trees dedicated to the righteous on the slope of the Mount of Remem Remembrance, Har Hazikaron, near the tomb of Herzl, a very important lieu du mémoir of the Jewish state. The best that could be said about the attitude of the Polish state and society to the righteous is that they were completely forgotten. The neighborhood of the Museum of the History of Polish Jews creates a great opportunity for the Polish society to honor their righteous as they deserve 70 years after the end of the war. The issue of the righteous, as indeed um, any issue concerning Polish-Jewish relations during the occupation, is not a matter to be clarified between Jews and Poles. It is an internal Polish matter. The social pedagogy in a lieu de mémoire in the center of the Warsaw Ghetto ought to be resolved 
by the state authorities, not by individuals. You have to understand that the righteous are really the forgot forgotten soldiers who, contrary to both the Germans and their fellow compatriots preserved during the war, focused on the Jews and the honor and national dig dignity of the Poles. A Jewish philanthropist who survived the Holocaust erected a monument of gratitude in this place using his own money. He would be expressing his intentions with, this, with these words, quote, to those Poles who are risking death at the hands of the German occupants for themselves and their immediate family, provided selfless help to a neighbor, a Jew, acting in isolation, despite the hostility of the Polish environment, thereby also saving the honor of the Polish nation. Great fee, grateful countrymen, unquote. It would be great if the postument could also bear the signature. President and both houses of the Polish Republic's Parliament. It would be a great loss for the Polish national interest and for the future generations of young people visiting the necropolis of the Warsaw Ghetto to become familiar with the history of their own country if such an inscription remain absent from the vicinity of the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Once we manage to express this truth in public space, it will definitely be a symbol that the Jews will slowly cease to be a Polish problem and will finally become part of Polish history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Over to Piotr Cywiński. Thank you very much. Well, I am going to be um, focusing on what is abroad. As usual, as is usual for Poles, we are concentrating or focusing on our own backyard without a broader context, which is quite specific to Polish-Jewish relations. In 989, I went to France, to Alsace. Uh, it was uh, one year before I took my O levels, um, a couple of years after Einstein's films. In the history book for my Humaniora class, uh, we had two pages about uh, deportation. And obviously, displacement was discussed extensively with regard to the French resistance movement, whereas right next to it, we had a small comment in des describing the um, Jewish displacement. And what was emphasized was that very few returned. 1989, that was France. We all began learning very late. Our discourse, our dialogue, Polish dialogue, took a totally different course altogether. It would be great if you could, we could compare all these discourses. There were two other foreign examples showing us how different our realities can be. The first example, U.S., Washington, the Museum of Indians. Uh, I do not know who of you uh, saw it, but uh, let me recommend that museum to you. You walk in, there are different tribes shown, then you ha can watch uh, a an extensive movie telling us that Indians were ecologists and they coexisted with nature. And then you have the main exhibition. Two main collections are shown there. The first collection is a collection of weapons, not of bows. That would be terrible to these Indians, mainly rifles and pistols. And then we also have a collection of Bibles, Bibles collected from a number of Indian tribes. And uh, the viewer does have a hope that at the end of the day, you will be able to reach the reason for which they read their rifles, but no such thing. A museum viewer can conclude that an Indian was a person with a Bible and a pistol, a rifle in his hand. And that all has been organized in, and by Washington. 
których i dobrze, że w Polsce, że tak powiem, nie poszło do tym. And I am very happy that Poland did not walk down that path, albeit there were certain premises suggesting that we could have well created such a scandal. Well. Seven days ago, the Arbeit macht frei. A gate was removed in Dachau, was stolen in Dachau, and uh, all of a sudden we were all branded specialists uh, in thievery. I then formulated my statement, uh, emphasizing German Nazi camps according to the UNESCO heritage, inscriptions and ideology. And for the sake of pure interest, I took a closer look at different results and quotations which had been published. I took a look at around 10 internet versions of German publications. No German publication uses the word Nazi camp or German camp. That's absolutely phenomenal. 30% could have missed the term, 50% could have missed the term. Whereas all of them actually missed the term German camp, camp or Nazi camp. In, well, one such publication said, Dachau is not part of Poland. Uh, I must say that diplomacy does have a weak or soft spot as well. Suffice to say, what does that look like from the Austrian perspective? Well, we have one and a half million visitors with uh, guides and guidebooks in 18 languages. The uh, German or Austro-German Austro factor does indeed or is emphasized the museum itself, and I must say that the word museum is very, very useful from the legal or organizational viewpoint. Well, the memorial, monument, place of remembrance, venue for murder. Nevertheless, it is not a venue for meetings. It is not a meeting place, nor is it a venue for dialogue. In general, people arrive in groups, and usually groups travel in packs, in packs of identity, whereas towards the end of their visit everybody travels alone. Possibly it is a venue for coexistence or co-empathy. I must say that remembrance or memory does not necessarily have to give rise to dialogue or common discussion. That tends to be overestimated, it tends to be over-exaggerated. This is something that we associate with a vision of dialogue. I do believe that Auschwitz could definitely be an example thereof. We have the history of a clash of different remembrances, of different memories, typically post-traumatic. All of a sudden you can arrive and people do arrive in different groups. There are very often cases where we see two groups arriving and there is a clash. It is visible at first glance. We do have groups arriving from France, from the US, and very often these groups included large numbers of Poles. Yes, indeed, my childhood memories do not uh, include extensive uh, Jewish remembrance. Nevertheless, to go back to these groups, yes, they do arrive and sometimes you see the clash and certain symbols of aggression. Let me recall the battle for crosses in Auschwitz. Nevertheless, we do encounter the dualism, the initial dualism, which then softens, with the exception of the Roma, who have begun going back to their roots, uh, to their often as not Jewish roots, I'm talking about the 1990s. Well, but when I take a look at our guides, when I talk to our guides, when I take a closer look at different study groups or people who visit us as tourists, what I do see is a greater acceptance of the 
conglomerate, cultural conglomerate that Auschwitz is. And I must say that mutual understanding and comprehension have become increasingly important and increasingly, increasingly visible. Today, what we are facing is a set of new generations, hugely interesting and very poorly analyzed. Everybody focuses on the fact that witnesses of those developments are slowly but surely becoming a thing of the past. We are only able to speak to individuals, to hand-picked individuals. This is something that everybody notices, whereas everybody fails to notice that we have subsequent new generations. Today, we have young people who are graduating from high schools and uh, people who still remember their grandfathers have a sense that whatever was done to gr my grandfather was done to me, whereas with regard to great-grandfathers or great-great-grandfathers, that is history, that is a thing of the past, that is ancient history. And such is the attitude of new generations, not because they have an issue with uh, accepting the testimony of a living ex-convict, a living ex-camp SKP, but that is ancient history to them. There is another matter that we have to understand. Teachers who accompany these young people have already visited these camps very often as young people themselves. Today we have educators arriving from abroad who have already visited Auschwitz in the 1990s, for example, and I must say that their teachings carry a different quality altogether. What shall the result be? I cannot say. Poland has a major problem with a complete lack of understanding for the importance of knowledge itself and for the importance that such venues could play in the curricula as outlined by the Ministry of Education. The curriculum itself has been reduced, has been broken down, which is absolutely ridiculous, not to mention the fact that books about uh, the Holocaust or books uh, describing camps can actually be published uh, up to one year before scientific findings are officially published. Poland today is one of the few large European countries uh, who does not have any sound system of encouraging teachers to organize study trips. What happens is that uh, people are encouraged uh, to travel to um, the UK or France. Nevertheless, both the UK and France have their own financial system, whereas Poland does not have any such curriculum, doesn't have any such project. And the fundamental reason is that teachers have less and less time to walk away from their own curricula and focus on a field trip or a study tour, which ultimately means that we have a growing number of uh, generations who have not encountered any such places of remembrance, such as Auschwitz. They cannot put them to their own use in the process of growing up or developing a specific consciousness or awareness today. We have more than 250,000 young people who have never encountered such a venue, uh, which is obviously a frightening thing. And please bear in mind that it is much easier to finance a coach or a busload of young people traveling to Auschwitz uh, from Suwałki or Kędzierz and Kozle than it is to organize a charter plane from Spain, and that also is truly frightening. Suffice to uh, talk to different young people to understand what kind of damage we might be facing. I do not know how I am for time, 
let me offer a quotation that was a bucket of ice water to me, I must say. Um, some time ago, when I began working at Auschwitz, I was surprised by the number of Koreans arriving to Auschwitz. The numbers were similar to Czechs, approximately 45,000 of each nation. Um, that can be contrasted with approximately 3,000 Austrians per annum. And they were very, very often groups of elderly people, very for a brief time in Europe. And I actually was walking around with keys, and people believe that since I was carrying keys, I know things. I was approached by an elderly gentleman, and he asked, okay, where are the lavatories or something similar? Uh, that was a South Korean gen gentleman, and I tried to ask him uh, why did he decide to come to Auschwitz. And he told me that he is a medium-level manager at, in a large corporation, and uh, he was given a five or six-day tour of Europe, and he was given a choice, Venice, Paris, and I asked him why here, and he was very, very surprised that I was asking the question. He said, well, because I always wanted to understand Europe. And I must say that it took me a long while to shed the shock. And that is all I wanted to say at this point. Possibly I will join the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, all our panelists have had an opportunity to offer their words of introduction. I will not say everything I wanted to say. We are pressed for time. Nevertheless, we are coming back to the dispute or the clash between the assimilation of some kind of horrible history and the taming thereof. Universal, universalization, is it a good thing or not? Well, Naukowska, when um, writing of a fate delivered by humans to humans, she concealed the German or camps, where Boinsky, when writing his poor Pol Poles watching the ghetto, he nationalized this way, he nationalized the... Title of a poem by Miłosz, the poor Christian, and this is something that uh, seems to be looming over us. This is something that Boinski could be accused of. Uh, he definitely twisted the leg of the hegemonic or monumentalistic discourse. This is the same thing that could be said of Miłosz. Which is exactly why I am trying to declare that different arguments were used to the benefit or to contradict a certain materialistic or hegemonic approach. Now I will hand over to panelists for very, very brief commentaries. Professor Smolar. If I may, I would like to discuss the topics of identity, identity and dialogue. Identity is definitely the topic of our discussion today. The Jewish question is definitely very painful to Poles. That is also hugely interesting, were we to compare our relations with the Germans or Belarusians or Ukrainians, we don't have a problem there, because even if crimes were committed against um, Ukrainians or Germans or Russians or Belarusians, Germans and Russians carried such responsibility that it did not create any moral problems. The Ukrainian question is slightly more complicated, nevertheless, uh, it is true that since we were, let's say, killing one another, the problem is not there. It is also the question of identity which had been formed under partition by the Christian and Romantic traditions, Poland as the Christ of nations, something that had been mentioned also by uh, Jan Gross for your freedom and ours. Therefore, from that viewpoint, our relations with the invisible neighbor cannot be really resolved. This is a key, this is a symbol which we cannot use. It neither cannot be resolved in a way that would be typical for Poles. That is reconciliation, the confession of sins, 
atonement and reconciliation. There is no one that we can reconcile with. Poles are trying to create a partner, individual Jews or Israel, who cannot really represent those who died or Jewish organizations with the U.S. Obviously, relations with Israel are very correct. Nevertheless, Israel, let us not forget that, needs Poland as a partner. Poland is one of the few partners in Europe that uh, is very open to Israel. The same thing goes for all diasporas. I would like to go, go back, come back to what Jan Gross said, but also um, Ms. Figura yesterday said that it is not a Polish-Jewish problem, it is a Polish question. We definitely have an issue with identity, which may serve to undermine the traditional identity and the process of its democratizing, the process of recognizing a certain nation as a set of individuals or as a society of individuals uh, with the good and the ba bad alike. In Poland, we definitely have a Gordian knot of sorts. So we do have, uh, we always have had the um, spoonful of mud in our battle of mead. I did not have the time to do that as part of my intervention. Nevertheless, uh, Poland did have the opportunity of un undermining the Holocaust culture. Jan Gross published his book, and it was not the Holocaust itself that was undermined or that was questioned. It was about um, a ritual on the one hand, monuments and classes and teachings. Sarkozy declared that each and every primary school student should adopt, quote unquote, a young deceased Jew, which was obviously very controversial. But in Poland, the situation was totally different. Uh, Polish debates are hugely painful and Polish debates are definitely a uh, point that was very, very optimistic as I see it, uh, the openness of the debate that was all debates that were, were, were held here. We have uh, historians and politologists and, and journalists such as Anna Bikon, for example. They have done a lot of good. We have unblocked the memory of the masses. It is not true that what we need is an inscription on the monument. A monument is a monument is a monument. Uh, it is going to be an edifice uh, that is going to be forgotten. What we need is fresh blood in the Polish historic bloodstream. What we need is uh, a painful process resembling that in Austria or in other countries uh, around Europe. In Poland, uh, the uh, dimension of the tragedy is definitely the largest and the problem of social behavior is much more dramatic than in other countries in Europe. Nevertheless, what we need is a comparative perspective. Robert Kostro. Two things, if I may. I would like to discuss the two levels that we use in order to hold our debate. They tend to be confused. History and politics on the one hand and ethics on the other. Specifically when it comes to the uh, home army and the Polish underground state. It is very difficult to organize campaigns without any chance for success. In other words, military commanders are not suicide victims. Roosevelt's attitude towards the Holocaust emphasizes the same problem. It is not only about Roosevelt being insensitive or intolerant or incomprehending. Even at war and in the face of of moral challenges, leaders go through their own calculations, and such calculations may be absolutely horrific from our vantage point and our ethics. Nevertheless, such calculations are a fact, and without such calculations there is no such thing as an army or politics or a war. On the other hand, we have the ethics at stake. 
We did have the home army. We cannot mythologize them. They really became powerful in 1943 or 44 when... Uh, the Holocaust was practically over in Poland. Polish Jews had already been murdered. So it is not true that in 1939 we had a home army of 500,000 who could run and save Jews and blow things up. They had to defend themselves. The majority of sentences passed were passed against collaborators, a threat to Polish conspiracy. Today we know that we did have Polish legislation who had been sentencing uh, criminals against Jews to death. Not all these sentences were carried out and not everybody was persecuted, that is true. But you also have to understand uh, that such sentences had not only been a threat to participants of those campaigns, uh, but also to people who were murdered as hostages. I.e. that was one of the reasons for which uh, the Home Army has to be forgiven in the sense that we could well stop and think whether they could do more in terms of saving Jews. I am not questioning the atmosphere or the climate itself. I do not intend to question the attitude of the of Poles in general. That is a different thing altogether. We have to understand that we have reasonably well documented attitudes that were unquestioned. Should someone decided to harbor Jews, they decided to also hide them and conceal the fact because that carried a major threat. Whereas uh, those who helped the Holocaust did not need to hide at all. That is another side of the story. And uh, thirdly, we also have to understand or we have to remember that uh, certain experiences had become the fill of the majority of Polish society, namely that um, people were sent to concentration camps. Such is also the story of my own family. My grandfather was sent to the Stutthof camp and my grandma focused on surviving. I had never talked to her about it. Um, I didn't talk to her about she felt sympathetic or not. Maybe there were certain taboos there. I do not wish to question that. Nevertheless, we should never forget the vast majority of Poles who simply fought to survive. And it would be very, very difficult to accuse those who are struggling to survive that they failed to take care of their fellow neighbor whose fate was even worse. I do believe that this level of discussion is very difficult, not because someone is questioning facts, but because that discussion occasionally involves people who, being on two sides of the barrier, tend to forget their respective positions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Gross. Just a couple of words uh, with regard to uh, what Alik said. Well, you said that we are approaching the end of the Holocaust era. You said that this is a topic which is slowly but surely becoming exhausted. With regard to Poland, I do believe that such a diagnosis is not entirely correct. Possibly, such as the perspective of a variety of public debates in France, for example, I do believe that uh, such could be the attitude of children who might have problems because of the simple fact that they are Jewish. The presence of young Jews in classrooms precludes open discussions concerning such parts of French history. I do not question that. Whereas in Poland, the Holocaust is something very special. 
Why? Because it is the central location of Polish history. It is something that has not been fully told until now. Why? Three million Polish citizens were annihilated over a very short span of time on Polish territory. This is our experience. Moreover, it remains a central motive of history of a very special and very specific times, which, in terms of uh, retrospect, but not only in retrospect, in general, in Polish self-awareness, the motive itself is uh, or carries a self-creating or self-development uh, component. Such was World War II. Holocaust was part of World War II. We cannot separate one from the other. We cannot separate one from the other in any context. Neither in the general nor in the specific. That is also a key component of Warsaw's history. The Warsaw Rising has its own museum, as we all know. Well, Darek's museum has part of an exhibition focusing on the Holocaust. Nevertheless, uh, were we to take a look at the Vesavian's experience, I do believe uh, that displacing Jews from Warsaw is a hecatomb, which goes well beyond anything known to history before, at least in Poland. And I do believe that this is a topic for public debate, but also for historic narration. Now, in terms of Poland, in terms of Poland, uh, the Holocaust will definitely be a topic going on for a long time. Professor Tokarska Bakir. Well, very many thoughts. I do agree with Professor Gross. The Holocaust is not coming to an end in Poland. It is definitely prospective rather than retrospective in nature. It relates to a specific situation. It relates to those who are absent, uh, to those who are the undead or the living Jews. They are still there as a group and they may indeed create a gap. I am taking on the collective perspective. The director tried to encourage us to take on an individual perspective, but being an anthropologist, I would be inclined to adopt the collective perspective. We do have a collective identity, and until the problem is resolved, until we go through a period of mourning, not only the traumatized will not free themselves, and I must say that their number is continuously dropping, but the entire society will not be able to free themselves of it. Uh, the society is still holding on. And the other thing I wanted to refer to is the topic of ancestors and our treatment of them. What I have in mind here is the Polish government under occupation and the authorities whom you defended. I do believe that these people should be treated like adults. They should not be defended. They do deserve to be treated without any kind of element of patronizing. There are very specific texts by Dariusz Libionka on the content of the information bulletin. I myself wrote a paper to mark the occasion of a conference organized by the Institute for National Remembrance last year. I described therein an entire palette or array of attitudes. Also, I described the information bulletin who had not referred to Jews as Polish citizens until the moment of the ghetto uprising. It turns out that the uprising heroism makes them 
citizens. And this is exactly what uh, Pierre Bourdieu said about the elements of distinction that we require to make somebody pi part of a community. This is also something that Professor Smolar said before, the ethnic rather than the civic. Last but not least, the Museum of American Indians. I saw the museum. I love it as an anthropologist and as an eth ethnographer. It was, uh, I believe, uh, the most interesting museum in Washington, much more interesting than the Holocaust Museum. What I really loved about the museum is that it was handed over to Indians. It was handed over to the heirs of American Indians. They were. It was handed over to contemporary Indians with a request for it to be filled with whatever they consider to be important to their identity. The gesture I found immense. It is a treasure trove. Once you decide not to approach the museum expecting standard narration that we encounter in other museums, we should perceive the museum how it was developed, bottom up. It is uh, a museum that was built with the use of fragmented voices of different tribes. It has more than two display cases. Some of them are hugely important, and the most important display cases, I believe, describe the process of developing Indian identity, how it developed and how it was defined. Unfortunately, in the case of the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, it is impossible for reasons mentioned before. Those Jews have already gone missing. We do have the gap. We are trying to charm it and enchant it and fill it with magic. I do believe that our discussion is such magic. Let me mention one other quote. quote. Um, in Princeton, at the history department of Professor Gross, a seminar took part, attended by James Young, who said a very important thing about monuments, and the museum is such a mon monument. Quote, rather than continuing to insist that the monument does what modern societies, by dint of their vastly heterogeneous populations and competing memorial agendas, will not permit them to do, I have long believed that the best way to save the monument, if it is worth saving at all, is to enlarge its life and texture to include its genesis in historical time, the activity that brings a monument into being, the debate surrounding its origins, its production, its reception, its life and the mind. That is to say, rather than seeing polemics as a byproduct of the monument, I would make the polemics surrounding a monument's existence one of its central animating features. For I believe that in our age of heteroglossia, to quote Bachtin, the monument suggests the monument succeeds only in so far as it allows itself full expression of the debates, arguments and tensions generated in the noisy give and take among competing constituencies driving its very creation. In such view, memory represented in the monument might also be regarded as a never-to-be-completed process, animated and not disabled by the forces of history bringing it into being. Unquote. Thank you. Piotr, very briefly, if I may, I would like to watch we were discussing at the outset of our debate. I also wanted to go back to what I said in my own speech that a Jews that Jews are identified with Israel. Some people believe that Israel is very, very good because finally the Jews have a place to uh, travel to. That is hugely anti-Semitic. It is an issue, and I must say that this is something I observed when the Polish law on national and ethnic minorities was being introduced about eight years ago. Well, the very title of the Act of Law, that we have national minorities on the one hand and ethnic on the other, suggests a difference. It was declared that the national minority has some kind of nation that they can identify with, identify with. 
abroad, obviously. It is grotesque, it is absurd. It also assumes that in the 19th century our risings or uprisings were ethnic rather than national, which is grotesque. I made many attempts to reach the parliamentary committee in order to engage in some kind of discussion to discuss that which is grotesque. I managed to reach them, although um, I, do, I am no part, I do not identify myself with any kind of minority. Nevertheless, I decided to discuss what is decentralizing rather than harmonizing? Are you better just because you have somewhere out there in the wide world that is not harmonizing at all? It was not the point to tell the Ukrainians or the Lithuanians that they have a country somewhere out there, but so that the Silesians do not feel offended. And that was hugely interesting. Now, in terms of uh, the different attitudes and approaches, let me close with that. When discussing World War II, I always remember what Władysław Bartoszewski said. He was asked whether he had the feeling that he did enough. And uh, Bartoszewski responded in the negative. He said, no, I did not do enough. Only those who are murdered for what they did can have the sense that they did enough. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is... Uh, the point we have reached. We have actually um, exhausted the uh, time um, because of what the because of the inertia of the chairman and the specificity of the topic. We have run out of time. I wanted to stick to time discipline, but that would be indeed a sin given the passion of arguments. Uh, Professor Smolar asked to speak first, uh, not because he's right here next to me, but because he was indeed the first. I would like to simply emphasize that the entire Holocaust era in Poland started several decades later than elsewhere, and this is why we are experiencing a sh time shift. Otherwise, I agree with what you said, and uh, Jan, and what Joanna said. I saw a um, somewhere rising their arm, Zbigniew Nasowski. I would like to refer to three issues, if I may. The right historical policy and the return of the Jews, uh, all of which have been symbolized by Jan Karski's bench, which has been established as a one of the barriers by the Polish nation to tame the museum. The righteous. Professor Tokarska Bakir said that they became heroes only once the collective could draw some benefit from them. Well, some people do believe that. Nevertheless, uh, my own experience is uh, to the contrary. The only benefit that we might draw from dealing with the topic resembles the benefit that we might draw from discussing Jews while being an ethnic Pole. The point is that you do what is the correct thing to do. Many people have been driven to deal with the topic, as I have. In a way, that was the driving force behind dealing with Jews. I actually lived in Otfotsk until I was 20, and I didn't know that Otfotsk was full of Jews. And I did not know that Irena Sendler was born there, that I actually lived across the road from her. And I only learned that when I was 40. And I didn't know that two priests from the parish where I was born and baptized had actually been uh, called the righteous among the nations of the world. And that brought me to shame, and this is why I decided to do what ought to be done, not because I have some kind of benefits to draw there from. Um, now, with regard to historical politics, I really like the discussion here. Professor Gross encouraged us to engage in historical politics. 
For example, that specific authorities ought to found or fund a specific inscription on a specific monument. And should authorities do that, everything would be fine and dandy, provided that the inscription is there. I would be very interested to hear what the professor has to say, what Professor Bakir has to say, uh, because uh, she actually contradicted the uh, history and politics in themselves. And the return of the Jews, Alexander Smolar was uh, correct in saying that this statement makes little sense in the context of the Museum of Polish Jews. Nevertheless, I would like to polemize with the reverse. The first thing that Professor Gross said today was that uh, Jews have been absent from Poland for several decades, and I have heard se that statement several times in the course of this conference. Okay, so who do I meet on an everyday basis? Whom do I make friends with? Whom do I engage in dialogue with? Are they not the living Jews? Whom do I support when I see the internal disputes in uh, Jewish di diasporas or communities? They are definitely proof of the fact that Jewish communities are dynamic and they are alive. They are there. Paula Savitska and then uh, Kostek Gepert. Thank you very much uh, for these very important and interesting um, comments. I will not polemize for reasons of time shortages. Let me comment on what Darek said about that, about that, the fact that different things, that Miłosz and Błonski could be accused of different things. Let me recommend the very deep and wise debate organized by Jerzy Wtorowicz about this poem. Jerzy Wtorowicz, Jan Błonski, Czesław Miłosz and Mark Edelman discussed that poem. A part of the debate was published by Tygodnik Powszechny, whereas the entire has been filmed and is available in archives. I do believe that this debate says a lot and explains it a lot. There is no reason for us to seek extra explanations because these four gentlemen had actually given us a precise description of what and how we should understand. I do, however, have an issue that was not discussed here. We were told that Jews were a Polish question or that anti-Semitism is a Polish issue. I wish to emphasize that today there is no question or issue of anti-Semitism as a Jewish case, a Jewish problem to Jews who are still live in Poland. It is definitely a problem for Poles and the Polish society. Why is that? That is because um, Jews are practically not there, whereas anti-Semitism is alive and kicking. I declare that because I have been dealing with the topic for the past years. Anti-Semitism needs things to live. It feeds off issues described very well by Alik. All these forms are present. All these forms are alive and well. So we should definitely ask, whom do we oppose? I do believe that uh, a certain rule is definitely there, something that Gering said, I decide who is a Jew. Today, the anti-Semites in Poland decide who is Jewish and who is not, and they have decided to place that burden upon the shoulders of those they deem to be unworthy. Um, the term Jew is still pejorative. Jews are guilty of what went wrong. The Jew is an enemy that ought to be destroyed quickly and completely. This is something that is very difficult to fight with because, for example, the Polish law says that if you are not a Jew, you should not be offended by such a term. Last but not least, I would like to say the following. Why am I talking about the topic at all? At all? Well, I do believe that it is hugely harmful to the Polish society and it is hugely harmful to the social... It is hugely harmful to Polish social tissue. It is harmful and it damages us. 
hatred destroys us. Whereas the continuous presence of a stereotype being used for a variety of purposes, such as, for example, struggle with uh, someone who do not who you do not like um, Marek Edelman always declared that anti-semitism becomes very dangerous when it becomes a political weapon and this is something that Poland is not free of Today we are witness uh, of the development of racism and anti-semitism based movements and they organize themselves in a political manner in closing, uh, let me mention a development and occurrence which took place uh, on the occasion of Marek Edelman's mural. A, an Italian friend of mine came to Poland and uh, he wanted to show that mural to his Italian colleague and... Uh, well, he talked to a lady who was passing by and he asked what happened and she said, well, that's very good. We have our own heroes. His works should be hung in the ghetto. And that tells the entire story. The story does not seem to be anti-Semitic, but let us try and answer the question, what stands behind it? The feeling of alienation and unfriendliness. Yes, the absent or non-existent, some say, Konstanty Gepert. Well, I would like to thank um, Mr. Nosowski and, and Stola for actually confirming that I'm still alive because I have heard stories, but I was even more relieved uh, when Alik uh, Smolar said that uh, Jews are no longer a Polish problem. I would not want to be an issue to my own country. Although I do have a sense of anxiety because if Jews are no longer a Polish question, then why are we organizing debate after debate about Polish questions? People meet, discuss and declare that there is nothing to be discussed anymore. Jews are no longer the Polish uh, problem. I'm going to be malicious and uh, pick on what Director Kostro said. You said that Poland was one of the most alien-friendly country, uh, including Jews. Well, yes. Um, what do you mean? Jews were part of the first Polish Republic from public from the word go. Uh, Jews were as alien to that country as Poland's and Germans and others. Thank you. I find it fascinating that this debate on the evolution of Polish identity in the context of Polish-Jewish relations, well, no Jew had been invited to uh, participate. We could obviously dig in our history, but I believe that the Nuremberg guys should be left to that particular device. Yes, we do have some participants here, uh, Anna Bikont and others who could add something here, unless the Polish identity has evolved so deeply that it does not need any such voices. And one other comment with regard to what Janek said about the monument. Well, yes, I understand that Janek was uh, avoiding my name in order not to compromise me, but I did say it, that the monument is not there and the inscription is not there and I thank you for not uh, making me look silly but the monument yes indeed was built for Jewish money and that is not its main feature nevertheless it does distinguish it from the monument on Grzybowski Square which is being erected for public money the money of all of you present here but yes Janek thank you very much for saying what you said you were the first to draw attention to that detail and I understand your concern so please um, take your time to learn something more about the details of the publicly announced competition the expression or intended expression of the monument will be directly derived from those principles. Now, with regard to the Israeli state and its gratitude, with regard to the Polish uh, state mm, and its gratitude, 
Well, I have a different, I have a different opinion, regardless of what the Israeli state d did, regardless of my hopes for the Polish state uh, should do in the future. Um, but I myself would also want to express my gratitude. Thank you very much. One question to the organizers. I know that we have um, gone well beyond our time. Okay, another five minutes. Miracle after miracle. Sławomir Dębski. I am a professional historian. For more than 10 years, I have been the head of state institutions engaged in politics or policy in one form or another, currently in the area of Polish-Russian relations. I have the following question to our panelists. What kind of conclusions can be drawn or should be drawn by the Polish state in light of the Polish-Jewish relations. For purposes of the future, I'm not only speaking of Polish-Jewish relations here. I do believe that uh, a question that was asked at some point here, why did the Polish underground state not blow up the railway line leading to Auschwitz? Obviously, there are many sides to the discussion. They could, they couldn't, there were the troops there or not, they were afraid, they were not afraid. Nevertheless, that particular question, I do believe that uh, is very, very valid and the society ought to be asking such questions incessantly. Why? Because that will allow us to answer the question, what if something similar happens in the future? In that sense, the question may help form and shape our future society, one that we would want to live in. Hence, it is not by chance that we have selected Jan Karski as a patron of certain attitudes. Yes, we are falsifying reality. Yes, he did work. Yes, he wrote reports. And yes, some parts of his reports were removed. He is also a very comfortable hero for the Polish society. Pol Catholic hero, soldier. Nevertheless, I would want a new opportunity to arise in the future for a Polish Jew to become the hero of the year, the patron of a campaign, the hero of a specific endeavor that would allow us, that would make it easier for us to reach the Polish society with a very open and obvious communication and message that we did have Polish-Jewish heroes who led others to victory and who can definitely serve as role models for the future society. Thank you very much. Thank you. I understand that the task is also on the borderline of a miracle, but since our panelists have been called to speak, I would like each and every one of our panelists to take one minute each to discuss the future and how to build the Polish society. Well, yes, uh, Costa Gepard called on me to speak on three matters, although I did not speak of them at all. Firstly, Jews are there in Poland, but they are not a community that can be discussed with as a society. They are individuals, whereas with regard to you being um, mentioned as pars pro toto for Jews, that is a joke. Well, um, we don't have Jews here. We do not know. Uh, I do not think that such seminars ought to involve national representation. I must say that with regard to what it means to be a Jew, what it means, actually, I would be interested in your definition of the term. And thirdly, a fundamental matter, Jews as the Polish question, I defined it. I didn't say that the problem is not there. I listed the problems. We do have problems such as identity problems, for example. Uh, in When we were working on that particular edition or issue of the annex, uh, I, we emphasized that Poland is a country of silence. Thank you. If I may.
I would like to refer to what Sławek Dembski said. With regard to the Holocaust, well, this debate is hugely important from the viewpoint of a democratic state. Regardless of how deeply we might differ, this is absolutely fundamental. Yesterday we were talking about Ukraine. The fact that Ukraine did not pass the process, well, that is an issue. Many other countries have the issue. That is the question of the individual. That is the question of human rights. That is also the question of how we treat individuals and of our identity, whether we have decided to build it on a collective paradigm whereby we proclaim ourselves to be a tribal nation going back to the Piast dynasty or are we a collective of citizens? So that is the matter of uh, historical politics. So it is not only about remembering or not remembering the Holocaust. Crimes against Jews uh, are also a matter that ought to be discussed in the Polish context. We cannot escape history. We could definitely wonder how to outline and define historical politics in order for us not to get away from it and it away from from us, it should not become any kind of weird tool, but it is a fact. Well, indeed, as a non-existent person, you have caused some turbulence, Kostek. Let me just say two things. My intention was not to deprive you or anybody else of the possibility or option to express anything, including your personal gratitude for having been rescued as a Jew. Um, under occupation. Nevertheless, uh, I must say that lieu uh, de memoir does not mean that anybody can erect a monument uh, just for the same simple reason of having money. Well, with regard to Mr. Rolat, our founder, uh, well, it is absolutely his right to erect a monument with a specific intent. I must say that the location of the venue are absolutely marvelous. Um, he is a Jew from uh, Częstochowa. If I, if memory serves, he is an honorary citizen of that city. Of that city. Well, Jasna Góra, possibly not. That is another lieu de mémoire. Regardless of his money, probably he will not be allowed to enter that space with his monument, although possibly the Paulines there will let him enter that space. But I do believe that also from the viewpoint of pilgrimages taking place every year, that would be an excellent location. That location ought to express truth that cannot always be expressed uh, and by Mr. Rolat, among others, uh, for reasons of his decency. I will be more than happy to learn more about the terms and conditions of com the competition for the monument and the inscription. The inscription could definitely read something like, well, Mm, grateful countrymen thank Poles for helping Jews regardless of the Nazi threat. I would like to respond to Mr. Nosowski. The inscription on the mo monument, as suggested by Professor Gross, would definitely be an expression of politics. Historical or not? Not necessarily historical. I do believe that historical politics is a conglomerate, and every conglomerate is lethal specifically to history itself, and history also tends to lose its sovereignty. I wish to emphasize that historical research, i.e. research engaged in with an effort to increase and improve awareness and consciousness what motivation may, might be the driving force for historians can also serve the purpose of eliminating certain elements and only such history may lead us to the exit from historical conflict 
that we have been experiencing. With regard to the righteous, Mr. Nosovsky was uh, discussing uh, the righteous from his own perspective, rather glori glorious, whereas I was discussing the matter from the viewpoint of the righteous having been used albeit after the war they had to conceal their identity and had been persecuted among others by home army soldiers there is a difference between the position of the righteous in theory and in practice and let me emphasize that uh, this is not my research but professor gross's uh, i recommend the copernican speech to you which is available online professor gross compared władysław bartoszewski's book with um, relations uh, from the 301 um, Zich archive collection. I believe historians present here know about those archives. It is hugely valuable and it is a treasure trove of knowledge. And I do believe that the gap between what has been removed for example, from Karski's um, report and uh, other texts, that gap contains the hegemonic vision that we are all going to be falling victim to before we try to free ourselves on it, of it. Piotr, well, what kind of conclusions we could draw for purposes of creating a society of the future? For the love of God, I believe that the society ought to create the state. The state should not create the society. And I do believe that this is one of the most important conclusions that we can draw from the Polish Jewish experience. Thank you very much. A round of applause for our panelists.